neighborhood Texaco service station welcomes you to another baseball broadcast. Brought to you direct from Wrigley Field by permission of the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team. And now out to Wrigley Field and Hal Totten, who is going to give us some inside information on today's game right from the playing field. Take it away, Hal Totten. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon from Wrigley Field, the home of the Cubs in Chicago, where the Cubs come home this afternoon to open a final four-game series with the St. Louis Cardinals, and where we're on the field for a little pre-game broadcast, looking over a crowd of 20,000 people, 15 at least, probably 20,000 before the game is underway, and a real welcome home crowd. The Cardinals are finishing their infield practice. The weather today is rather amazing. It started out this morning cloudy and finally rained a little. Right now, a nice dry Strong north-northeast wind that third things up. It's pleasantly cool out here. Sun is out, and it's going to be quite an afternoon. The uh, Cubs come home from a trip that, while it was nowhere near as successful as the preceding road trip, was still quite a trip on the road. And uh, yet they lost several tough ball games, very tough ball games, and some of the fans have wondered. Oh, you know, questions have come to me time and again there. What's wrong with the Cubs and this, that, and the other thing? Well, my answer has always been that as far as I can tell, there's nothing the matter with the Cubs. He might not have been hitting for the moment or something like that. So I've asked a young man, a very red-headed young man, to come over here and chat with me this afternoon and tell you a little bit of the inside of something that perhaps doesn't ordinarily come to your mind. Along this line, this man is Johnny Gordon, the coach of the Cubs, who we've talked to before. And one of the uh, coach's chief jobs is not only to help develop young players and keep them going and correcting faults, but keep a ball player's head up and keep them going good. And I just want to ask Johnny Corden a few questions along the line of just how it is. It's a pretty tough job when the going gets a little bit tough like it is now with the pitching and fielding great and hitting going bad. It's a little bit tough for, well, for some of those youngsters. Certainly it is tough, Hal, but I can answer that question uh, in this respect. A baseball player's life is, in the, is the same as any other individual in any line of business. No matter what profession any outsider might follow outside of baseball, he leads with reversal. And I claim this, Hal, that in order to be successful, one should try and encourage an individual when he's leading with reversal. In other words, a ball player that's going out here, for instance, any ball player, say for, uh, Galan, for instance, comes out here and makes four base hits in one day. And we win the ball game. Naturally, he doesn't need any encouragement because he, is, no, he knows he's delivered. That's the picture game. Otherwise, if he's met the difficulties on the ball field, stuck out a couple of times as men and running scoring positions, that's when I claim that fellow needs attention. He needs a little encouragement. None of us needs encouragement, Hal, when we are delivered. And we know when we are delivered. Therefore, I would like to make much of the one thing. The ball players that represent and wear a cup uniform need encouragement, not from only from the manager or the coaches, they need it likewise from the fans that attend these ball games out here. And one word of encouragement, or a little applause, when a man enters that batter's box that he stuck out the time before, would do more good than to jeer that boy, antagonize him. He knows he failed. Why not try and encourage that individual? He's wearing a Chicago uniform, representing your city. And I claim this, that a ball player on the road, away from home, does not expect any encouragement, uh, nor does the fans that cheer him, or uh, give him the raspberries, use the slang expression. That does not bother that ball player, Hal. But it really does at home. It really discourages him when he fails to deliver to have the home crowd to ride him. Then you mean that uh, even here in the professional circles where fellows are paid for playing ball and uh, making their living at it, that a matter of encouragement and crowd reaction is really a very vital thing in regard to their play? That is absolutely that. Absolutely that. On the road, it does not bother me. Expect them. Sometimes they invite that. Sometimes but not, they play a little better on the road when they're getting it from the next. Is that right? That's right. But at home, really, they, they like a little encouragement home from the home fans, especially when they're meeting with reverses. Have our boys been a little bit down the last week or so because of lack of hitting? They think that they're going to start finding those hits pretty soon? They feel that way? Absolutely. Well, I noticed that chatting with them before the game during practice just now. They seem to feel that, well, they're home now and some change has got to bring another change and they're just about ready. Yes. Well, Johnny, I wanted to find out from you... Uh, 
Now, I might let the fans know that the first time I'd heard those sentiments spoken was when you spoke them just now. It wasn't prepared to rehearse. That's I wanted to know just how you felt it felt. And that's why I put you on cold here. You didn't even know you were going on the air until you started out to hit the infield and infield practice. Positively not. And uh, it's a pleasure. And you said something interesting and well worthwhile. And I want to thank you for it, John, and wish you and the Cubs all the luck in the world. Thanks a lot, Hal. And thank you, Johnny. Uh, Johnny Corden, Logan Sport Red himself. He idol of the Elk Club at Logan Sport, Indiana, who is the coach of the Cubs and was giving us something well worthwhile. Now Pat Fox is here to give us our first lineup of the home today, and so let's have it, Pat. And battery for St. Louis, batting order, Moore center, Chris second, Jay Martin right, Metric left, Mines first, David Cut, Hiroshi short, Garibaldi third, and Winford pitcher. For Chicago, the battery, David, and Hartman. Batting order, the land center, Allen left, Herman second, Hartnett cut, Demery right, Max third, Jerky short, Jim third, and Davis the pitcher. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very, very much. Now we really know the Cubs are home and we're on the way, and we get that announcement from uh, Pat Fight. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the umpires are going to get out there pretty soon. It's a little bit tense on the way up, so I think it'd be a good idea if I got an early start. With that in mind, George, how's my bodyguard getting along up there? All right? Well, Jimmy Snyder, he looks pretty tough up there, but I guess that's all right. He's got to stay for the day. He's not today. So, uh, if you'll uh, do a little switch in the studio while I'm on the way up, I think it'll be swell, George. Okay? There's one thing you'll notice about most motors. A really careful motorist isn't careful only of how he drives. He's careful of everything about his car. Perhaps that is why so many experienced drivers prefer the new Texaco motor oil. New Texaco motor oil meets their most exacting demands on every count. It's heat-proof, full-bodied, and tough. It has the stamina to stand up under the terrific punishment given motor oil in today's faster cars. The tough, clinging film provides safe lubrication every mile of the hottest drive. New Texaco motor oil comes to you in refinery sealed cans. The purity which Texaco's own solvent refining process makes possible is protected from refinery to you. Every last bit of plant is removed from new Texaco motor oil. It starts circulating and protecting your motor the instant you step on the top. So start treating your motor to the best today. Drive to your neighborhood Texaco service station and tell the attendant to drain the crankcase and refill with the new Texaco motor oil. And now while Hal Cotton is on his way up to the booth, out there at Wrigley Field to bring you this afternoon's baseball game, between the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals, we'll give you the schedule of the other games to be played in both leagues this afternoon. First, in the American League, the Chicago White Sox are playing in St. Louis against the Browns this afternoon. That game will start about 4 o'clock our time. In Detroit, the Tigers take on the Cleveland Indians for another game this afternoon. In that game, the warm-up pitchers for the Indians, Brown, for the Tigers, Bridges. In Boston, the Red Sox take on the league-leading New York Yankees. The batteries, roughing and picky for the Yanks. For the Red Sox, Grove and Rick Brown. That game has already started in Boston, and at the end of the fourth inning, the Yanks and the Red Sox are tied nothing to nothing. The Washington Senators, playing their home stay, take on the Philadelphia Athletics this afternoon. That game has not started, and there are no batteries yet. Now over the National League. At Wrigley Field, the Chicago Cubs take on the St. Louis Cardinals in a four-game series under the two points of batteries just given you by Matt Piper and Hal Cotton. Winford and Davis, the batteries for the Cards, the Cubs using Davis and Hart. In New York, the Giants are taking on the Boston Beat. That game, at the end of the first half of the third inning, is tied, nothing to nothing. Captain and Lopez, the G battery, the Giants starting Chris Simmons and Mancuso. In Philadelphia, the Phillies take on the Brooklyn Dodgers. At the end of the second inning, the Dodgers and the Bills are tied two to two. Johnson and Wilson, the Philadelphia battery. The only other game scheduled today is in Cincinnati between the Reds and the Pittsburgh Pirates. That is a night game. Will be played this evening. And now for a look at the standing of the club in both leagues. First in the American League, the New York Yankees are in first position. They've played an even hundred games. Today is the 101st game of their entire season. Of that number, they have won 66 and lost 34. Second place is held by the Cleveland Indians, the Chicago White Sox, 12 games behind. Fourth place, Detroit Tigers, 12 and a half games behind. Fifth, 
The Boston Red Sox, 13 and a half games behind. Six, Washington Senators, 16 and a half. Seventh, the St. Louis Browns, whom the White Sox play today in St. Louis, 31 games. And in eighth place, in eighth the Philadelphia place. Athletics, 32 and a half games behind. In the National League, the Chicago Cubs are in first place by two decimal points. They have won 59 and lost 38. In second place, the St. Louis Cardinals, who are playing the Cubs this afternoon at Wrigley Field, they have a percentage of 600 and two decimal points behind the Chicago Cubs for first place. Third place, held by the New York Giants, six and a half games behind the Cubs. Fourth place, the Pittsburgh Pirates, eight games. Fifth place, the Cincinnati Reds, 11 and a half. The Boston Bees, 13 and a half. Seventh, Philadelphia Phillies, 21. And in eighth place, Brooklyn Cubs, three and one half games behind the National League leading Chicago Cubs. And now for a look at the standing of the home run league. In first place, New Gary of the Yankees, 33. Second, Foxy of the Indians, 31. Third, Fox of the Red Sox, 30. Fourth, Mel out of the Giants, 21. Now I see that Hal Sox is ready, and we'll go back to Wrigley Field for the baseball game brought to you by permission of the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals to stimulate interest in our national games and in your local team. Take it, Hal Sox. Back at the ballpark, ladies and gentlemen, for the start of the ball game, and the umpires are just this minute walking out on the field. The two pitchers are finishing their warm-up down here in front of the stand, hitting the seat. Cubs captain starts out of the dugout and up toward the plate, and... Uh, We'll be on the way out here in just a moment or two. The lineup we got from down there in the field, and uh, I don't know whether it'll be worth while some people like both here tuned in late. There comes Leo DeRosa walking up there with the Cardinal lineup. I might give the lineup over again for these people who tuned in late and give them very quickly so as not to run into any activity. The Cubs are running out on the field for the start of the ball game. Cardinals, Terry Moore at center, Frankie first, second, Pepper Martin right, Joe Medrick left, Johnny Mai first, Buck Davis at Virgil Davis, Captain, Leo DeRosa is short, Mark Garibaldi third, and Jim Winford the pitcher. For the top, Gordon Galan center, Ethan Allen left, Billy Hummings second, Gabby Hartnett second, Emory, Frank Emory right, Stanley has played, Billy Jacobs short, Charlie Green finished. Most of the umpires that you probably heard over the PA system, Canelli at the plate, short at first, and Furman at third. And we're just about ready to go with the start of this ball game. With Terry Moore, a right-handed hitter up there at the plate to start the first inning. Davis winds up, throws, and Moore takes a fast strike over the heart of the plate, about way high. One strike on Moore. And Kurt winds up, throws again. The hitter hits one hard down to Charlie Grimm, who scoops it off the top of the ground and then runs over and steps on first base anyway. But umpire Stewart, located there at first base, had raised his arm in the air, indicating the ball was caught on the line for the first out of the first inning, bringing Frankie Frisch to bat. Frankie switches around in his hitting, fall down the middle waist high, one strike on manager Frisch. Davis again winds up, throws, Frank gets the curveball wide for ball one, so it's one ball and one strike on Frisch. One and one the count. Davis throws once more for the second ball. It's wide across the way from the count of two balls and one strike on Frankie Frisch. Two and one. Davis throws again for ball three. It's inside and low. And so the count is three balls and one strike on Frisch. Three and one. Takes that easy wind-up pitches once more. And ball four comes in pretty wide. You get first to base on ball. Puts him on first base with one out in the first inning. And Pepper Martin. Good old Pep up there at the plate. There's your boyfriend up there, Jim. <laughs> Jimmy Snyder, that auto racing fellow, is up here in the booth with us. We were down having a chat with Pepper Martin, who's a big midget owner himself. Davis throws the first one to Martin, and it's inside of across the chest for ball one. Step that's right-handed, of course. 
Ryan Kurt waits there for the next sign from Hartnett. Swings around as he gets it. Takes a look at the first base. Then throws and the hitter swings in a high bounder. Billy Herman breaking far to his left. Gets it. Throws to second and the runner there is out for the second out. Billy went a long ways over to his left to get that high bounder and threw to Jurgis at second base to four straight for the second out, leaving Martin on first base with two out in the first inning. And Joe Medwick, the cardinal left fielder and a great hitter up there at the plate. Joe is also a right-handed batsman. Among other things, he hit a ball into the right field bleachers against the wind and batting right-handed before the ball game today. Batting practice. Davis watches the man at first and pitches, and Joe hits the ball to right field, but Demery's going back fast and makes the catch for the third out. And so it's no runs, no hits, one man left on base in the first half of the first inning of this opening game of the big series with the Cardinals. And the score is nothing to nothing as the Cubs come to bat in the last half of the first inning where they somewhat juggled lineup from that we've seen here. Old Pat starting to do a little paging of people out here. Or Dodge, Iowa, huh? Well, the out-of-town people are getting paid in the ballpark. There are a lot of people from out-of-town here. We were stopped downstairs by several of them from all over the Middle West who come in here to see them, including a lot of people who came up from St. Louis. They just couldn't wait to see those Cardinals get home. I hope they go out when they get home. The... Uh, Cards have had a good finish to their road trip. The two clubs were just the opposite on the road. The Cubs started off winning and then ended up on the short end, whereas the Cardinals started off losing and ended up winning pretty well on the road. Both of them came close to splitting even on the trip. And here is Augie Galanis back, back to his old leadoff position. He's a left-handed hitter against right-handed pitching, and that's the way he's batting against Jim Winford, a great, big, rangy fellow. He's and throws, and the hitter bunts the ball down toward first base. Pitcher goes over to get it, and throws the ball to Mize, who started in and backed up to take the throw. And it's a perfect sacrifice by Allen, play going from Winford to Mize for the first out of the first inning, putting Galan on second base, and bringing Billy Herman to that. Billy Herman, the cup. Second baseman of the right-handed hitter. Still takes a look around the umpire and takes the pitcher who moves some third out and threw a pebble off the pitcher's mound. Now he steps on the slab. He gets ready. And pitches, and the hitter swings, hit a throw bounder down the third base line, but it's foul. Garibaldi grabs it, throws it over to DeRozan, and goes on around the infield. With Myers returning it to the catcher, and Buck throws it off the pitcher. When forgets it, standing back in the grass, back to mom. Walks slowly up, picks up the rod and bag, drops it, and takes his place on the slab once more. Getting his sign, pitch the next one to Billy Herman. One strike on Bill. Ready once more, throws, and Bill takes the ball, it's inside and low, so the count is one and one. One ball and one strike on Herman. These two teams are really battling it out for the league lead now. Whichever one wins is in first place tonight. So Winford's ready once more, throws, and the hitter swings, hit a slow bounder into the infield. Winford comes in, takes it on the first hop, throws the first, and Herman is out easily for the second out of the first inning, moving the land to third base. So it's two out of the first inning for the Cubs. The land is on third base, and Gabby Hartnett is at best. Gabby gets quite a greeting to Japan as he steps up there to the plate. There. Winford takes quite a while getting his time. Finally, he starts his wind-up. Pitches, and it's a strike over the inside corner about knee high, and Gabby comes back and points that that ball was a foot inside the plate. He draws his bat along 
there inside the batter's box and telling umpire Finelli that he thinks he gave him a bad decision on that. Dave just stands there looking away and <laughs> Bud Davis reached down and dust off his shoes where Gabby put dust over it by scraping his bat there. Finally, Gabby goes back. He's still talking a little bit long distance to Finelli. In the meantime, Davis has walked out to talk to Pitcher. And finally, Dave goes back to tell Gabby a few things. And they stand there face to face with Gabby getting very, very red in the next apartment while he tells Dave what he thought about that one. <laughs> one thing about Leo, though, you'd notice that yeah, the umpires usually take what Gabby has to say. They figure that if he thinks he has a fault, he'll fault. He got over those days when he used to holler about everything. And also, he does it in such a way that while he puts on something of a show against the umpire, at the same time, what he says doesn't get him very mad. Gabby stepped out of the box, but he's back up there again with a count of one strike. Wins it takes the usual long time, finally winds up, throws. And Gabby swings it along, fly, but it's into the wind out in left center. And Mendrick's waiting for it. He has it, and it's three out. High fly into the wind into left center. Without that strong wind from the north, northeast, that ball would have been way, way over that wall. But as it was, the wind held it back as it was holding all the balls back in batting practice from both clubs and blowing them all around. So it's no runs, no hits, one man left on base in the last half of the first inning. And the score remains nothing to nothing between the Cubs and Cardinals at the end of the first inning of the first game of this series. Stop and think of the hundreds of miles that you drive your car every month. That faithful motor under the hood is doing its best to give you carefree driving. You can really help things along by just a little thoughtfulness. Give that hard-working motor the benefit of complete modern motor lubrication. Drain, and then refill with new Texaco motor oil. Then see and feel the difference in the performance of the motor in your car. That goes for midgets too, Jim. <laughs> Say nothing of that big, powerful white job that throws it around. First man at bat in the second inning, Johnny Mize, husky, left-handed hitter, steps back to take the first pitch inside across the waist for ball one. I think they're going to try keeping that ball high on Johnny. Maybe I'm wrong. Davis winds up, throws again, and he hits the ball into left field. Uh, Allen is racing over four, but he can't reach it. Lands beyond him by the time he recovers it. Mize is carrying for second base and gets in there just ahead of the ball. Two base hits the left field, a place he doesn't ordinarily hit. Allen was playing him pretty well toward left center because he's ordinarily a pull hitter, but he had doubled to, to left center, or rather to left field, dead left field, for the first hit of the game. And Mines is on second base, nobody out in the second inning. And Virgil Davis is at bat. Big Spud Davis, the husky right-handed hitting catcher and a dangerous one. Spud steps up there to the plate. And Kurt Davis is getting ready to pitch the first one to him. Looks back at second base. And throws and the hitter takes the curveball inside for ball one. One ball call, but you're ready again. Pitches and the hitter started to swing, stopped three quarters of the way through, but it was a strike. Caught the out the inside corner up around the shoulders. He was around pretty far on it anyway. So it's one and one. Davis steps off. Let's bury the umpire on that decision. Finally steps back up the plate. Without further ado. And the pitch is ready once more. Looks back at second base. And pitches and the hitter swings and misses a high pass ball for strike two. And it's one ball and two strikes on Davis. And two is the count. Davis swings around. He's ready again. Suddenly, wind starts to kick some dust up. So Davis steps out of the batter's box. The way the wind was blowing the dust, the dust would arrive just the plate just about the time the ball did, and that wouldn't help Davis' vision any. So he steps out of there till the wind and dust settled. Davis throws again to Davis, and Buck fouls the ball high onto the roof of the stand above and to the right of the plate, and it's one and two. Still, one ball and two strikes on Bud Davis.
Kurt has the sign once more, keeps an eye on the runner, but pitches, and it's a curveball wide for the second ball, taking it two balls and two strikes. On spot, two and two the count. One, two. Kurt ready again, but just the buff pitch again, the hitter walks out of the box. The umpire calls time, and Davis had actually started his pitching motion and had to practically fall off the mound, keep him throwing the ball. It's two and two, two balls and two strikes. And the hitter swings the ball, this one back onto the screen, or onto the net back of the screen and back of the plate. It's two and two. Two balls and two strikes on Davis. There's his sign again. Throws and Bird falls this one way back into the lower deck, to the right of the plate, back under the second deck, and it's still two and two. Two balls and two strikes. They just stopped to use that big floppy rod and bag. The hitters have waiting back there. Eyes and hands, then sets up the plate once more. Davis pitches and the hitter swings it, a bounder down the shortstop. Jurgis chases the runner back to second, then throws the first, getting Bud Davis for the first out of the second inning and holding my eyes on second base. So it's one out of the second inning for the Cardinals. My eyes still on second base, and Leo DeRocher is up there at the plate. Well, Leo's been promoted in the batting order. He's hitting seventh now instead of eighth. Right-handed hitter waits, gets a look back at second base. And throws, and the hitter takes a fast strike. Pretty one over the heart of the plate. Way caught. Davis, big, rangy right-handed, throwing that ball with very low sidearm delivery. Kurt throws again, and it's ball one inside and low. So it's one ball and one strike. On DeRocher, one and one. The team set still watch the second base, but throws and the hitter hits the ball into left field for a good base hit. Allen comes in fast, grabs it, and throwing the ball to the plate, and the runner turns around and goes back to third base. Boy, that was fast fielding. Allen came in, grabbed that ball, and with the same motion, whipped it toward the plate. And the coach, Mike Gonzalez, waved Mize back to third base because that throw would have had him. Cardinals have runners on first and third. One out in the second inning, and Garibaldi is at best. Art Garibaldi is a rather a small fellow, rather stockily built, although slim above the waist, but he hits the ball with a lot of power, and Frankie Fish was telling me before the game he's been hitting the ball pretty hard lately. He came up some weeks ago from the Cardinals' new chain club out there in the Pacific Coast, Sacramento. Throws now, and the hitter takes the curve ball wide for ball one. One ball call. Charlie Root has started to warm up out of the left field bullpen for the Cubs. Chase Davis really experiences a bad inning because until the Cubs get to hitting again where they can overcome the lead, they've got to nurse the pitching along. And getting great pitching, they've got to nurse it along very carefully. Davis throws fast the first base. The was is back there. Billy Herman is playing a little bit toward second base and in. Dirk is playing a pretty deep shortstop. And the hitter swings the next one to hit a high fly going foul down back to first base. And it's back into the seat. It's one and one. One ball and one strike. And the pitcher waits out there again. Davis slaps the ball into his glove a couple of times. Swings around on the slap. Then pitches, and it's a ball that hits the dirt back of the plate. Drops out of Gabby's glove to the count. It's two and one. Two balls and one strike. Davis takes quite a while getting his sign again. Finally, seems ready. 
and pitches. Garibaldi swings and it's a high fastball outside for strike two. And it's two balls and two strikes. On us, going through the count. First again, but once more the runner's back pass. Davis going his share of holding that runner on base. Again, the pitcher throws the first. But the runner's back ahead of the throw, so Grimmer jerks it to Kirk. And as he steps on the rubber, he finds Garibaldi out of the batter's box. He's up there again. Davis ready. He throws once more again. The runner's on the go. The hitter swings and misses. And they trap the runner between second and Third, first, and Billy Hammond throws the ball to the plate and trying to get live, trying to score. Tried to work that run home. Garibaldi struck out. The Roker started for second. Hartnett's throw cut him off, so he stopped and tried to jack him back and forth long enough to let the runner get home from third base. But they walked carefully, and Mize eventually was out at the plate on a throw from Hartnett to Billy Hammond. Two hot nets for the third out. And it's no runs, two hits, one man left on base in the first half of the second inning. The score remaining nothing to nothing between the White Sox. Uh, between... I've got the White Sox still on the air, George. We've had them on the air for the last two weeks, so i got to get used to keep putting the Cubs back on the wireless here. Nothing to nothing between the Cubs and the Cardinals as the Cubs come to bat in the last half of the second inning with Demery, the first man up. The broadcast of the Cubs Cardinal game comes to you direct from Wrigley Field. A moment of Cubs in Chicago is a presentation of your neighborhood Texaco dealer, distributor of Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline. The broadcast comes with the permission of the Cubs and the Cardinals to stimulate interest in our national game and in your own local baseball team. This is WCFL at Chicago. Frank Demery, the Cubs right fielder is up there. Winford throws the first one. Frank hits the ball to the shortstop. Grosser comes up with it, throws the first, and Demery is out easily for the first out in the second inning. One out of the second inning to the Cubs, and Sammy Hack, Cubs third baseman. Now in that sixth position batting, he is up at the plate. The sign winds up and throws the first one and stand. Left-handed hitter lets it go by. It's a strike over the heart of the plate about way high. One strike on Hack. Throws again for a ball inside and low. And it's one ball and one strike on Stanley. One and one. up throws again and there comes the second strike just barely caught the outside corner knee high breaking away from the hitter and naturally the catcher's glove was way low and wide when he caught it but that ball came over the outside corner above even with the knee and it's one ball and two strikes throws again and it's inside and low for ball two making it two balls and two strikes on Stanley Hatch. to his account. And there comes strike three over the heart of the plate above the knees. Then started as though to go to first and realized he'd let a good one go by. Well, I don't know. I've heard some batsmen say, big leaguers, that when they get a lot of them, in fact, that when they once got in a hitting slump, about the only way they knew to get out of it was to start to go after every ball that looked good. And it was, even it was just barely in reach, so they started hitting them again. On the other hand, other hitters will try to be more careful when they're in a slump. Jurgis at bat takes the first pitch inside across the cap for ball one. The right-handed batsman. Winds up again, throws, and the hitter hits a little hard smash, and it turns off Frankie Frick's knees, and Bill is at first base. The Cubs' first hit of the game, the hard smash, and one that's very, very hard to handle. One of those balls that lands just in front of the hitter, or the fielder, at an angle. He's going over to it, and if he doesn't field it just exactly right, or guess where it's going to bounce just right, why, 
going to go for a base hit. That ball hit and didn't come up. It bounded low and hit Frank in the knees and bounded out into center field. So Jurgis is on first base with two out. And Charlie Grimm is at bat. Winford looks at first base and throws over there, but Jurgis is back fast. You know the Cubs are going to play for that one run, and that Jurgis is liable to try to go down. There he goes, and the pitch is wide. Davis gets the ball, throws it out there, and the runner is out at second base on a very good throw from Davis to DeRocher. Jurgis out stealing, Davis to DeRocher for the third out, making it no run, one hit in the second inning for the Cubs. And at the end of the second inning, Cubs and Cardinals are tied, nothing to nothing. Remember, if you haven't done it already, or if the scorebook, Mexico scorebook that you've obtained, is just about filled, pick up that request card in any Texaco service station, fill it in, it's already addressed to me, it just asks for your name and address on the reverse side, the one cent stamp on it, and mail it in Chicago, and or just mail it, doesn't matter whether you're in Chicago or not, by Cracky. And you'll get this scorebook, which has the official blanks for 17 full games, pitching the Cubs and stocks, the rosters. But in addition, our full scoring system with explanations and illustrations, the one we've used here in the press box for some 15 years. The first pitch now to Winford, the Cardinal pitcher is as bad as the fastball over the heart of the plate for strike one. That's just above the knees. Davis winds up again, throws, and there's ball one and missed the inside corner, breaking toward the hitter. And it's one ball and one strike on Winford. One and one to count. Winds up again, throws, and Winford swings in a high bounder. Jurgis gets it on the second half, throws the first, and Jim is out for the first out in the third inning. One out of the third inning for the Cardinals. And more. Terry Moore, the center fielder, is up there. Right-handed batsman. Starts to wind up now. Throws. And it's a high one inside for ball one. One ball called on Terry Moore. Davis again winds up pitches. And it's a wide one across the knees for ball two. Making it two and nothing, two balls and no strike. Then Davis pitches and Moore hits a line drive and oh, Billy Herman makes a leaping one-handed catch that brings the crowd right out of their seat. Boy, the fans just stood up in a body that time as Billy Herman racing to his right, leaped into the air, speared that ball with one hand and hung on to it for a pretty, pretty play, and the second out in the third inning. It was highway robbery, but boy, what a play it was. And it's two out in the third inning for the Cardinals with Frankie Pritch, St. Louis manager and second baseman up there, taking the first pitch for a strike, just above the knees, over the heart of the plate. There comes a wide one for ball one, making one and one on Pritch. strike on Frisch. Two out for the Cardinals in the third inning. And the hitter hits the next one and drive out into left center. Galan's racing over fast and makes another pretty play. A nice running catch in left center by that old ball hawk, Doggy Galan, out there. Two plays in a row that were beauties. So it's no runs, no hits in the third inning. And both Galan and especially Billy Herman are getting great hands. Billy's just trotting into the bench now, and the crowd back in the dugout giving him a great hand for that play that he made. No runs, no hits in the third inning. And the score, still nothing to nothing, as the Cubs come to bat on the last half of the third with Charlie Grimm, Cub manager and first baseman, the first man at bat. Water boy, the last of the Rickers just going over to get a glass of water for old man Susan. You come in here and sing Water Boy next, I suppose. <laughs> 
Rupert has finished a rather brief warm-up. And the ball is thrown out there to second. Finally gets around to third where it comes to pitcher with an underhand toss. Winford walks slowly back onto the mound. And Charlie Grimm steps up there to the plate. He was at bat when Jurgis was caught stealing for the third out in the second inning. Winford pitches and Grimm takes a high fast ball outside for ball one. the next first pitch, a high fly out into left center. The center fielder and he comes in to make the catch easily for the first out in the third inning. One out in the third inning for the Cubs, and Kurt Davis is at bat. Kurt Davis, the pitcher, right-handed hitter up there with one out in the third inning. Hard the first pitch to miss it, landed right down on his knees, and it's strike one. Winford throws again, and Kurt started the swing, got three quarters of the way around, and stopped. But it's a strike, and strike two. Two strikes on Davis. Pitcher has the time throws, and Kurt swings, hit the ball hard down to the third base from Garibaldi, scoops it up on a short hop, throws the first, and it's two out in the third, and the ball went right straight at Garibaldi, and it's two out in the third inning for the Cubs, we have the leadoff man, Augie Galland, up there to plate once more. Augie stopped, or rather Davis stopped to say something to umpire Pinelli as he's walking back toward the bench and takes his windbreaker jacket from back to that boy and put it on. And the first pitch to the land is a curveball wide for ball one. Augie walks to open the Cubs first inning. Got as far as third base. Swings the next hit a high fly out toward first base. Mines is circling under it as the wind blows it. And makes the cut just out back of first base, there by about two feet for the third out. So it's no runs, no hits in the third inning for the Cubs. And the score is still nothing to nothing between the Cubs and the Cardinals at the end of the third inning. And now for up to minute scores, complete batteries from other cities, we return to the studio. In the American League, the Chicago White Sox game in St. Louis for the Browns has not yet started. In Detroit, the Tigers are playing the Cleveland Indians at the end of the second inning. They're tied, nothing to nothing. Brown and Becker, the Indian battery, the Tigers using Bridges and Hayward. In Boston, the New York Yankees lead the Red Sox at the end of the seventh inning, two to one. Rushing and Dickey, the Yankee battery, Grove and Rick Farrell working for the Red Sox. In Washington, the Philadelphia Athletics lead the Senators at the end of the first half of the first inning, one to nothing. Rhodes and Hayes, the athletic battery, the Senators using Weaver and Millies to start with Sable catching in the first. In the National League, in New York, the Giants lead the Boston Bees at the end of the sixth inning, two to nothing. Chaplin and Lopez working for the Bees, the Giants, Fitzsimmons, and Mancuso. In Philadelphia, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Phillies are tied at the end of the fifth inning, two to two. Becker, Baker and Phelps, the opening battery for the Dodgers, Clark pitching in the first, Johnson and Wilson starting for the Phillies with Bowman on the mound in the fourth. And now back to Wrigley Field and Hal Dutt. Take it, Hal. Back at the ballpark for the fourth inning, ladies and gentlemen. Trevor Martin, the first man at bat for St. Louis, hit a long fly out to deep right center where Frank Demery caught it for the first out. Now Medrick at bat, Davis pitches, and Joe takes a fast strike over the heart of the plate about waist high. One strike on Medwick. Bat for St. Louis, hit a long fly out to deep right center where... Frank Demery caught it for the first out. Now Medrick at bat, Davis pitches, and Joe takes the pass strike over the heart of the plate about waist time. One strike on Medwick. Hurt is winding up again. Pitches, and Joe swings a high fly down the right field line. Demery tearing cross, serving foul low, and it's well back in the seat when it lands down at the end of the right field stand for strike two. Two strikes on Medwick. Running that ball out because it started fair, but not only had a natural slice on it like that drive of yours, George, but.
but uh, also had the wind blowing it in that direction. Where was that my drive? That's it. No. Howard Davis eliminated that from mine. I don't know what you got. Oh, I see. Two strikes to count, but she throws the next one, and it's ball one. It missed the inside corner a little below the waist, making it one ball and two strikes on Medley. One and two. One and two. Davis throws again, and Medwick swings a high fly to right field. Demery is ranging over to his left easily and makes the catch for the second out. So it's two out of the fourth inning for the card. And Johnny Mize, the powerful left-handed hitting first base from the Cardinals, steps up there to the plate. Mize at bat. Lines up, throws the first one, and John takes it inside across the gap for ball one. One ball call. Throws again, and Mize hits the ball out in the left center. This time, Allen comes in fast to make the catch for the third out. And it's no run, no hits in the fourth inning for the Cardinals. The score is still nothing to nothing between the Cubs and the Cards. Cubs coming about in the last half of the fourth. With the first man up being Allen. Well, we know we're home now, George. Here's the wire. There's 100 shoemakers strong for Cubs in Texaco and yourself. Trust me, and the Hansfield Shoemakers Club. That's a good old institution here in town. Winford's walking slowly out there into the infield. Air ball, he's tough to pick up the ball that he's to warm up with. So it ends. He walks out there with sort of a shuffle. Finally starts his warm up with Davis. Ethan Allen stands out there to the left of the plate, waiting in his turn at bat. Ball goes out to second base to Trace. He throws it to DeRocher. He to Carabal. He dropped it, but he picked it up, crossed it to the pitcher. He used the rosin bag, looks around, he dries his fingers, and then steps slowly up onto the slab. And Winford is getting a sign from Davis. Pitch the first one, pitches for a ball wide. And it was breaking down, although it started pretty hot. So it's one ball on Allen. He winds up again, throws, and it's a fast strike on uh, over the heart of the plate, just below the weight. So it's one and one. One ball and one strike on Allen. One foot again, and just the cap, that's his sign, starts swinging, wind up, pitches. And he swings and it's an easy bounder right back at Winford who gets it, throws the first, and it's one out of the fourth inning. For the Cubs, with Billy Herman getting a nice hand as he comes up, fans remembering that play he made on Moore's smash in the third inning. For nothing to nothing with one out of the fourth inning for the Cubs, and Billy Herman at bat. Billy hits the first pitch out in the left field for a good clean base hit. Looping single to left by Herman. Edward gets it and throws it back in. And Billy's on first base. One out of the fourth inning. And Gabby Hartnett is at best. Hartnett up there to plate. Don't forget the sign. Gets ready to pitch the first one to Leo. And throws, and he takes a strike over the heart of the plate, just above the knee. One strike on Hartnett. Throws again, and Billy Gabby swings it a high fly out to left field. Left fielder Medwick coming in, DeRosha going out, but Joe calls for the ball and makes the catch still on the dead run in toward the infield and just inside the foul line. Coming a long way to make that cut, but he yelled the roaster away from it, so Leo stopped going out, and Joe came in to get it. So it's two out of the fourth inning for the Cubs. Herman still on first base, and Frank Demery is up there to play. Demery at that. Throw the first one, turns and throws the first, but the 
Running a back pass. Stop talk. Umpire Stewart out there about something. Bill takes his lead again. The throws and it's a strike over the inside corner across the chest. And it's one strike on Demers. One strike down. Waiting out there again. As the sign, he's ready. Steps off the slab suddenly. Turns around, walks back on it again. And he's ready to pitch. Throws and with a runner on the goal, the hitter takes one inside. And Herman is out easily stealing. He's throw going from Davis to Fritz, who had the ball before the runner got there and then blocked him completely off the base so he didn't have a chance of getting in. And it's no runs, one hit in the fourth inning for the Cubs. Score remaining nothing to nothing between the Cubs and the Cardinals at the end of the fourth inning. If you haven't tried Marfac lubrication on your car, you've never ridden in a really smooth-running, quiet automobile. Marfac, you know, is the exclusive Texaco chassis lubricant which lasts twice as long as ordinary grease. It stays put and really lubricates. Drive to your Texaco service station, say Marfac, then find out for yourself what smooth riding is. Kurt Davis has finished his warm-up, and the Virgil Davis, who was still in the bench, suddenly discovered he was one of the plates. So he comes running up there, carrying one bat, ready to face Kurt Davis, takes his plate there. Davis now gets his sign, starts his wind-up, and throws, and the hitter swings, hits the ball hard. Herman is out there and manages to leap into the air to take the ball, but it goes on through in the right field for a base hit. Billy was playing very peculiarly that time. He was way back in the grass and actually over to his left. Not over towards second, but away from it. And he raced over farther into the grass, leaped in the air and managed to tag that ball, but couldn't quite get it. So Davis is on first base. Nobody out of the fifth inning for the cards. DeRocher, the Cardinal captain and shortstop, is a bat. Take a look at first base and gets ready to pitch the first one to Leo. Throws, and DeRocher takes the fast strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. One strike on DeRocher. She throws again, and it's a skirt ball wide and low, but ball one. The count is one ball and one strike on Leo. Suddenly comes off the left plate to dig up some dry dirt. Wipe his hands and lift dry. Walks back up to the plate again. Davis swings around to get the side. He's ready to pitch. Pitches, and it's a wide one. They thought they saw a hit and run or steal sign on there, apparently. He had to be called for a pitch out. The runner dashed back to first base. The count is now two and one on DeRosa. Two balls and one strike. You ready? Throws again on the hitter. Swing did a high fly out into right center. Demery is waiting for it there. Comes in a little. Has it. And it's one out of the fifth inning for the car. Davis still on first base. One out of the fifth. And Garibaldi is up there at the plate. Davis throws the first one, and Art takes the first strike over the inside corner about knee high. One strike on Garibaldi. Third has his sign again. He's ready. Pitches, and the hitter takes the curveball inside for ball one. So the count is one ball and one strike on Garibaldi. One and one. Kurt 
Throws it down the header, swing, hit a pop fly down back to first base ball. Grimm is following it over there and makes the catch for the second out. So it's two out in the fifth inning for the Cardinals. Davis, Virgil Davis, the catcher, is still on first base. And Winford, the Cardinal pitcher, comes walking up there towards the plate. Slav gets ready to pitch the first one to Winford. Pitches and the hitter takes the ball. It's wide and low for ball one. One ball call. And it throws again for a strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. And it's one and one. One ball and one strike on Winford. Once more, and Winford swings and misses for the second strike. Fast ball wide. With one ball and two strikes on Jim. One and two. Davis is on first base. Two out in the fifth inning. Kurt Davis, the pitcher, swings around ready again. Pitches, and Winford takes strike three right down the middle, letter high. And he's called out on strike for the third out in the fifth inning, making it no run. One hit. One man left on base. In the first half of the fifth. And the score remains nothing to nothing between the Cubs and the Cards. Cubs coming to bat in the last half of the fifth inning with Frank Emery of right fielder again, the first man up. I just want to chuckle about something that happened out there in the, on the field before the game. It seems that Pepper Martin and Johnny Mize use exactly the same bat, except that, of course, at the factory, they uh, have their own names put on. And yet, while Mize likes to use Martin's bat, that is, Martin is the name that Pep's name on, Pep uh, just won't use the, those with Mize's name on. Except, as I said before, they're the same bat. So today, Medwick walked up with a brand new Johnny Mize bat. He sneaked it out of the pile in front of the bench and handed it to Martin. And Mize discovered it just as Pep stepped up there to the plate. And he started ribbing him about, well, you wouldn't use in the game, and now you're going to break a brand new one in batting practice. And Pepper hit two or three good ones with him. But Mize kept ribbing him, and he kept turning around saying, I'll make him so mad he'll make four or five hits today. That seems to be the way those fellas work. Just get base hits and win games. No matter who gets the hits and who wins, just throw it to Cardinals. First pitch to Demery is inside across the waist for ball one. When patrols again, Frank gets a long high fly into the wind in the left field. Wind's holding it up and throwing it toward the foul line. And Medley comes over fast, but can't reach it. And lands back in the front row of Boxy. Way, way down beyond the cup bullpen. And it's one strike on Demery. Frank was all the way around the second base when that ball finally landed. And when it started, it was very much fair, but it had a curve on it, and in addition, the wind blowing in from the northeast was curving it toward that foul line. One and one to count, one ball and one strike. Pick the throws the next one. Frank hits it on the ground. Out to DeRosa who gets it easily over toward second base. Throws the first. Mize has to make a one-handed stab of the ball. He manages to hang on the first base with his toe spike and makes the play for the first out in the fifth inning. One out of the fifth inning for the Cubs. And Sammy Hack, the Cubs third baseman, steps up there to the plate. Hack at that. Now Stan swings in a long drive off the right center. Center fielder racing back and makes the catch back there for the second out. Only outfielder swing pretty well in today because of the headwind. And so Barry Moore had to really gallop back and to his left. But he was back there so that he was turned around and waiting for the ball when it arrived. So it's two out of the fifth inning to the Cubs. And Bill Jergis, Cubs shortstop, is at best. Jergis up there at the plate. First one, and Bill takes the third ball wide for ball one. One ball call. 
Went for that sign again. Winding up. Rolls. Still hits the ball hard out in the left center for a base hit. His second hit of the game and only the second hit, or third hit, rather. Paul Swinford, the other hit, was made by Billy Herman last inning. The ball was hit into left center just out of the reach of Drocher. It puts Jurgis on first base and two out of the fifth inning. And Charlie Grimm at bat. Grimm up there. Back at first base and throws, and Grimm falls this ball back onto the net back of the plate for strike one. One strike is the count. One strike, and the pitcher ready once more. Very well, the Jurgis tried to steal last time after he'd already thrown the first try to hold him there. Jurgis got back. The win first takes the plate again. And then again throws the first. This time Jurgis is back even more quickly. The throws now, and Grimm swings in a high fly in left field. Left fielder coming in, calling for the ball, but. DeRocher goes back and calls for it also, so Medwick stops up, calls to Leo to make the catch, and he goes back into short left field again. For the third out, making it no runs, one hit, one man left on base. In the last half of the fifth inning, and at the end of the fifth inning, the Cubs and Cardinals are tied. Nothing to nothing. Now again, for just a moment, we return to the studio. Don't overlook this opportunity of getting your own personal copy of the 1936 Texaco Baseball Scorebook. Hal Totten has made it possible for you, too, to be able to record every game play-by-play. Play. It's great fun. Weeks after a game is played, you can go back and read your own play-by-play play record, play record of the game. The scoring system is explained in detail, and there are blank score pages for plenty of games. In addition, from day to day during these broadcasts, Hal Totten will amplify the instructions over the air as the plays develop. The 1936 Texaco Baseball Scorebook also contains a wealth of other interesting baseball data. Rosters of both teams, together with pictures, averages, ages, and nicknames of the players. All Major League schedules are complete in the book. And it's easy to get your copy. All you have to do is go to any Texaco service station and ask for a request box. Sign your name and address on the card, stamp it, and drop it in the mail. Remember, the 1936 Texaco Baseball Scorebook is free. Just ask for a request card, write your name and address on it, and drop it in the mail. The cards are already addressed to Hal Totten. Make it a point to send in your request today. And now back to Wrigley Field for the continuation of the baseball game brought to you by permission of the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team. Back at the ball slot from sixth inning, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Moore. The Cardinal center fielder and leadoff man, first man up, took the first pitch for a call strike. Next one he fouled it back into the stand for strike two. And Davis winds up again, throws. Jerry takes ball one, it's inside and low. The count is one ball and two strikes on Moore. One and two. Throws again, and Moore swings in a pop fly, coming down, foul back of the plate. Hartnett's coming back under it, and has it for the first out in the sixth inning. One out in the sixth inning for the Cardinals, and Frankie Fake, Cardinal manager and second baseman, steps up there to the plate. Adding left-handed right that against the right-handed pitching of... Davis in the first pitch is a wide one across the way for ball one. One ball call. Two ready again, winds up. Throws in the hitter swing, hit a ball hard in the center field. Glenn's racing across fast, gets it. And it's two out in the sixth inning. Line drive to center. Glenn got a good jump on the ball and came over to make the catch look easy. All the way traveled a long way. And it's two out in the sixth inning for the card. We have Pepper Martin, Cardinal right fielder. Good old Pep up there. I think we can get him one of those midgets tomorrow night out there, uh, Riverview, uh, Jim. He wants to. He'll be there, but Phillips is trying to keep him out of it, I think. 
Martin swings the first pitch in a long one up the deep left center. Galant way back in front of the bleachers. Has it. And it's three out. The ball was very well hit, but also was right into the wind. And the ball hit into the wind that way today isn't going to have much luck. That ball had a good chance of at least hitting the screen of not going in if there's been no wind there. It was mighty well hit, but it resulted in an easy out because of the way it started to sink as soon as it got up there high enough for the wind to hit. So it's no runs, no hits in the sixth inning for the Cardinals, and the score he is still nothing to nothing as the Cubs come to bat in the last half of the sixth with Kurt Davis to pitch the first man up. Each team has made just three hits so far. This broadcast of the Cubs Cardinal game comes to you direct from Wrigley Field over the Cubs of Chicago as a presentation of your neighborhood Texaco dealer, distributor of Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline. Broadcast comes with the permission of the Cubs and the Cardinals to simulate interest in our national games and in your own local baseball team. That's the WCFL at Chicago. Winford's out there finishing his warm-up. As Davis came from the bench up to the plate, and you heard the nice hand that he got. There goes the ball out to second base again. The Cardinals have one of those routines with Chris getting the ball and throwing it backhand to DeRosa, who slips around, throws it to Garibaldi, and he runs in on the grass. He either tossed it or lobbed it to the pitcher that runs back to his position. Now Winford out there starts to wind up. Throws, and Davis swings in a high fly to right center. Right field is in there waiting for it. Has it. Martin was right alongside of him there, calling for him to make the catch. And it's one out in the sixth inning for the Cubs. With Augie Galan up there at the plate. Galan at that. Winford starts his wind up. Throws. Augie swings it a beauty out to right field, going on down the line. All is field pass by Martin. Galant makes the turn. But Martin's quick throw and a good one into second base would have had him. So he turns and goes back to first. A good single to right field, but very well fielded by Martin. And well thrown into second base to hold Galant at first. So Augie's on first base with one out of the sixth inning for the Cubs. And Ethan Allen, the Cubs left fielder, is at that. Takes your plate there, wins for pitches, and he takes a ball. It just missed that inside corner, and I believe it's also a little bit low. It's one ball called. Fish playing in a little for this man, but DeRoche is playing pretty deep. Fish and Billy Herman move around very much alike out there in the field. Now with a runner on the go, Allen swings, but follows the ball on the ground to the left of the plate, and it's one and one. He seemed to wait. Well, he thought that Galan hadn't had a good start and might be caught and then to protect the runner, he punched at that bad ball and fouled it to make it one and one. One ball and one strike on Allen. Galan on first base. One out of the sixth inning for the Cubs. Score nothing to nothing between the Cubs and the Cards. Turns and throws to first base and runs back there easily. But he again pitches and Allen swings in a high fly in the right center. Ball is curving back toward Martin, who is waiting for it, makes the cut. <laughs> so to stagger around there for a minute, step back, step forward, step back, and then leap forward to make the cut. And it's two out. And that brings Billy Herman up there. To land on first base, two out of the sixth inning. Herman at that. Brown gets ready. Back to the runner, then pitches. Billy hits the ball hard into left field for another base hit. His second hit of the afternoon. Moves Galan to second base. The ball is fielded fast by Medrick, who lost no time. Failing it into third base to hold Galan at second. And the Cubs have runners on first and second. Two out of the sixth inning. And Gabby Hartnett at bat. Hartnett up there at the plate. Gabby waits while Davis and Winford have a little conference with manager Frisch. They're all back to their positions now. As Gabby steps up there, infield and outfield all move way around toward left field. And the infield is playing very deep. Gabby hits that ball hard. And they're playing way back where they can get a good jump on it because Gabby isn't especially fast. 
And Gabby hits the first pitch. In the left field, the base hit. Then rounding third base on his way to the plate. And Billy Herman stops the second as the throw comes in to third base from Nedwick. Singles the left field by Hartnett. Going to land. And leaving club runners still on first and second with two out and one run home. That's the first run of the game, and the Cubs are now leading the Cardinals. By a score of one to nothing. And Frank Demery is at bat. Demery up there at the plate. Went for getting a shot, picked the first one for him. Takes quite a while getting it. So Demery gets tired, steps out of the batter's box, does his hand. Steps back up to the plate. Cardinal start Huser warming up in the right field bullpen. And on a slow ball, the header hits the ground ball to Garoto, who throws the first to second. And Hartnett is out for the third out. Forced out for the third out. Tried to change the pace on Frank, and he went right after it, without waiting, and beat it into the dirt for an easy play. So it's one run, three hits, two men left on base. The last half of the sixth inning, and at the end of the sixth inning, the Cubs are leading the Cardinals one to nothing. Now again, for complete up-to-the-minute scores and complete batteries from other cities, we return to the studio. In the American League in St. Louis, the Chicago White Sox lead the Browns at the end of the first half of the first inning, one to nothing. Lions and Sewell, a battery for the White Sox. The Browns using Thomas and Giuliani. In Detroit, the Tigers lead the Cleveland Indians at the end of the first half of the fifth inning, one to nothing. Brown and Becker, the Indian battery. The Tigers using Bridges and Hayworth. In Boston, the New York Yankees defeated the Red Sox by a score of four to two. Ruffing and Dickey working for the Yanks. Grove and Rick Farrell starting for the Red Sox with Wilson on the mound in the ninth. In Washington, the Philadelphia Athletic lead the Senators at the end of the first half of the third inning, 5-2. to two. Rhodes and Hayes, the Athletic battery. Weaver and Millie starting for the Senators. Sable catching in the first and Cascarella on the mound in the third. In the National League, in New York, the Giants defeated the Boston Bees by a score of 4-1. to one. Chaplin and Lopez, the Bee battery, the entire route fit. Simmons and Mancuso going the entire distance for the Giants. In Philadelphia, the Brooklyn Dodgers lead the Phillies at the end of the first half of the seventh inning, 4-3. to three. Baker and Phelps opening for the Dodgers. Clark in the first and Jeff Foote on the mound in the seventh. Johnson and Wilson, the opening Philly battery, Roman pitching in the fourth, and Jorgens hurling in the seventh. And now back to Wrigley Field and Hal Totten. Take it, Hal. Joe Medrick, first man at bat in the seventh inning for the Cardinals, got a hold of the first ball pitch and hit a terrific smash to left field. And the only thing that kept it from being a home run was a very strong headwind that held it down. It hit the wall about two feet from the top, bounded back in, and resulted in a two-base hit. So Medrick is on second base, but nobody out of the seventh inning. And the dangerous Mr. Mize is at that. Charlie Root again starts to warm up in the cup bullpen. Davis looks back at second base pitches, and Mize takes a high one wide for ball one. One ball called. I think the boys have a feeling that Mize is bad on the high pitches, but in one spot that Davis has a little trouble pitching, he usually keeps the ball low. The next one is wide for ball two, making it two and nothing on Mize. Two balls and no strikes. On again with kick. Most wide swing right. Up to him, and he can't quite get it. And he went through for a base hit. Made a great drive for it, but couldn't get it. And it ties the score. A one and one. The old gas house gag, pretty tough. And you get him behind. Now Davis is bat. Mines on first base. Nobody out. One run home in the seventh inning. Score a tie, one and one. Davis pitches and he hit her far, tries to bunt, and follows the ball on to the left of the plate. Little pop fly, too low for anybody to get. And it's one strike. On this, one strike to count. Davis ready again. They're still expecting the bunt. But Bud instead, he was all set to swing and then let the ball go by. In fact, he had to jump back, let it come by inside. Or ball one. The count is one ball and one strike on Bud Davis. Won the count. Bud was all set again to swing, but let the pitch go by wide for ball two. And it runs the count. Two balls and one strike on Davis. Two and one. The 
Stewart has the sign again. Pitches. Bud jumps back to take the third ball. It's inside across the wave. And Kurt really seemed to be having trouble. Boy, if you want to see action, you should take a look at that St. Louis bench. Boys down there clapping their hands. Dizzy Dean's walking back and forth, throwing his arms around. They're stamping their feet, hitting the floor of the dugout with bats. Boy, how they're going. Kurt throws again, and the hitter follows this one. It bombs off the catcher's mask and clear into the stand to the right of the plate for the second strike. The run it to three and two. Three balls and two strikes. But not only got a lot of color, but a lot of fight, and they want to win. Look at that Diz, regular cheerleader, right up there in front of the dugout, telling Spud to hit that ball. That fellow that he's supposed to be on the outs with, more or less. Three and two to count. If he turns and throws to first base, runner gets back ahead of the throw. Davis again throws the first, and the runner slides back this time. As Grimm grabs the ball, puts it on him, but there's no play, so puts the ball, sends it back to pitcher. Davis pitches, the runner's on the goal, the hitter follows the ball back onto the net, back of the plate, and it's still three balls and two strikes on Davis. Still three and two. isn't overly fast, but he's not slow, and he's a great big fella, too. He and do the count on Spud. Davis is ready again. Pitches again. The runner's on the go, and again, it's a foul back onto the net. And it's still three balls and two strikes on Davis. Still three and two. Quite a while, team set again. And he pitches, and Davis follows another one. High back onto the net this trip. So it's three and two still on Spud, with Myers again taking that walk back to first base. Cardinals have tied the score in the seventh inning, have one run home. Still have Myers on first base, with nobody out. So a tie one and one. Big Spud Davis, the Cardinal catcher at bat against Kirk Davis, the tough pitcher. Finally swings around again. He's ready. He pitches. And the hitter swings and misses. Striking out. And this time, Myers didn't try to run. But they had a hunch out there. And if he tried to run that time, it's almost a sure shot. They'd have doubled him. But he stayed at first base. And so Davis, but Davis strikes out. It's one out in the seventh inning for the card. Myers still on first base. One run home. And Leo DeRocher, Cardinal captain and shortstop, is at bat. Leo swings hit the ball hard into left field for another base hit. Allen fields the ball carefully. Throws it over to second base when he sees Myers jumping there. And a chase him back in a hurry. Billy Irvin had to go in my try hitting ball pick, but Myers was looking around at him, so he threw the ball back to pitcher. And at the third hit of the inning, the Cardinals have runners on first and second with one out, one run home in the seventh. And Garibaldi is at bat. Suddenly time is called. And somebody's gone to bat for Garibaldi. Charlie Gilbert is going down to warm up and go back in to play third base. Somebody coming up there. The bat is played for Garibaldi. Myers goes running over to the dugout, gets a big drink of water while he got a chance to take that time. The pinch hitter is Jimmy Collins. Chris Collins is the pinch hitter. Now Mike Gonzalez is running over there to the bench to consult with Frankie Frank. Also to get used that call to get some water. Mike could have gone right into the cup dugout to get a drink if he needed that bad, but he wanted to talk things over with Frank. Collins is the pinch hitter in place of Garibaldi. And a dangerous hitter he is to have up there, too. 
Cardinal dead runners on first and second with one out, one run already home in the seventh inning. For a tie, one and one. Davis ready to pitch to Collins, who also switches. And as far as batting left-handed, and the first pitch is wide across the chest for ball one. Gilbert is warming up in the bullpen. So is Buther. Be ready to go in in case of emergency. Davis throws the next one. It's another bad ball. Very wide. So Hartnett walks out alongside the plate for returning it to the pitcher. Third has the sign again. Takes another look at second base. Pitches on his ball three. Another bad ball high and wide. And the pitcher is really in a jam now. Has a count of three and nothing on a very dangerous hitter. With runners on first and second, only one out, one run already on. Davis gets out of this jam without serious damage. He's going to have to do some of the greatest pitching he's ever done right now. Third is ready once more. Throw, then it's a strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. Run the count, three and one. He balls in one strike. Collins may go after this ball if it's any good. And it's got to be good, or else he gets base on balls anyway. He throws and Collins swings it along, foul away down the right field line, back into the seat, and it's still three and two. He gets the ball very wide, so Hartnett walks out alongside the plate before returning it to the pitcher. Bird has the sign again, takes another look at second base. Pitches and it's ball three, another bad ball high and wide, and the pitcher is really in a jam now. At the count of three and nothing on a very dangerous hitter, with runners on first and second, only one out, one run already home. Davis gets out of this jam without serious damage. He's going to have to do some of the greatest pitching he's ever done right now. Bird is ready once more. Throws and it's a strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. Run the count, three and one. Three balls and one strike. Collins may go after this ball if it's any good. And it's got to be good. Or else he gets base on balls anyway. The throws and Collins swings it along, foul away down the right field line, back into the seat, and it's still three and two. So he gets the ripper out, or he is walked. Go on base. Chances are there'll also be a pinch hitter for Winford. That's why Huser is warming up so hard out there in the bullpen. Apparently the cards figure this is their big chance. Now Davis swings around. He has his sign. Here's the big one coming. He turns and throws the second, and the runner almost is out there, but not quite. Jurgis came over. Third World made a good throw there, and they very nearly got the man out. And again, Kurt was all ready to throw. He stepped off the rubber and faked the throw. Runner dashed back, but Kurt held the ball when he saw that Myers was right there. Going to get too much of a start. Jurgis is playing right off back to second base. Davis still watches the man in second. This is, and the common swings hit a foul. It's coming into the stands to left the plate up in the second deck. It's still three balls and two strikes on Collins. Gabby's out there talking to Davis out in front of the mound. Two of them turn go back their position. Gabby turns, says something up by Finelli, then turns around. Talks once again, and so Collins steps out of the batter's box. The umpire calls time. Rips back up there again. Down three and two. Davis ready to pitch. Pitches and Collins takes strike three. Right down the middle and he didn't go after it. Down the middle about knee high and he takes the third strike for the second out. That makes it two out in the seventh inning for the Cardinals. Now Charlie Grimm's over there in the mound to talk to Davis. As the two men walked up there to the plate, he hit Okardowski, who's the Okardowski, the catcher, he is going to bat in place of Winford. He's a right-handed batsman. Mr. 
ready to pitch the first one now to Bruzzi. Throws, and he swings in a high fly going foul back at the plate. Hartnett starts back. The wind catches it, carries it back, and it lands on the net and sticks up there, up above the box seat. It's one strike on Ogrodowski. Oh, that Davis is pitching out there. How he's pitching. Cardinal runners on first and second. Two out, one run home in the seventh inning. For a tie, one and one between the Cubs and the Cards. Watching second throws, and the hitter swings and misses a curveball inside for strike two. Two strikes, and Okadowski. Two strikes to count. Still watches there, then pitches, and the hitter hits the ball back to the box. Billy Herman gets it, throws a long throw to first base, and he's out. He's out for the third out, and Kurt Davis really did a job of pitching that time. Really did a job of pitching. He pitched as I don't think I've ever seen him pitch. Thank you. Walter Johnson comes in to tell us the official figures for today's game. 27,000 people. That's a lot of people. For a midweek game, it's a special lot of people. There's the announcement of what we announced a minute ago. Gilbert playing third, Houston pitching. Start the last half of the seventh inning. Broadcast the Cup Cardinal game comes to you direct from the ballpark as a presentation of your neighborhood technical dealer. And with the permission of the Cubs and the Cardinals to stimulate interest in our national game and in your own local baseball team. WCFL at Chicago. Houston throws the first one to Stanley Hack. He's the first man at bat in the seventh inning. And Stan takes the curveball wide for ball one. Wind turns up some dust. Steps out of the box. Time is called. But he's back up there to play it again. Houston pitches. Stan swings in a slow bounder toward third. Gilbert comes in, gets it, and Stan beats it out. Beat it out for a base hit. He was in there almost a full step ahead of the ball. Very, very fast, you know. And he really beat that ball out. He was going down that line like a scared rep. And it puts Hack on first base with nobody out in the seventh inning. And Jurgis, Bill Jurgis is back. Myers comes over to talk to Davis and Huster. Huster's a right-hander, called Slim Boy, and pitches with a sweeping sidearm delivery. That's plenty on the ball. For a tie, one and one. So he has a chance to win himself a ball game here. He's around the rubber again. They're expecting Jurgis to bunt. And he does. He bunts the ball out there. Pitcher comes over, gets it, throws to first, covering first. And Jurgis is out on the sacrifice for the first out of the seventh inning. Hank going to second base. So it's one out of the seventh inning for the Cubs. Hack on second base. And Charlie Grimm is at bat. They may walk Charlie. Charlie hasn't looked very tough up there to play so far today with two easy flies. But first base is vacant. It's getting near the end of the ball game. And the pitch is the next man up. On the other hand, they may figure that they've cut him off before. He's in a slump and batting eight. They'd rather pitch to it and put an extra runner on base. Yeah, that's what they're going to do, but they won't pitch anything good, I'm sure. Unless they feel that they can get him on it. The first pitch is wide and low for ball one. The world's throw to second. Hack goes back. There's nobody going over to cover. And takes the lead again. It's ready. Looks back at second one. More throws. He hits one foul down the left field line. Oh, that ball was just outside the foul line. Hooked to the right. That would have been inside. And a very, very dangerous base hit in a spot like this. Charlie hit the ball good. Didn't quite get around on it. And it was a vicious smash. Foul. Just foul. Down past third base. So it's one and one on Grimm. One ball and one strike. Watch the second throws again, and Charlie swings in a long fly out the left center. Center fielder's back there, though, makes the catch, and it's two out. He throws the ball hard into the roster. He deflects it over to Gilbert. There's nobody covering third, but Davis dashes down there. And so Hack stays 
At second base, the ball was well hit. The line smashed off the left center, but there's another ball that was made easy to handle by that strong wind blowing in. So it's two out in the seventh inning, and Kurt Davis, the cup pitcher, is at bat. Kurt comes walking out of the dugout up toward the plate. Now it gives him a hand as he walks out there. A chance to possibly win his own good ball game right here. Kurt finally arrives. At the plate. That's right-handed. Houston swings around, gets ready to pitch. Pitches him, hitter swings and falls the ball into the stand to the right of the plate. Just misses the second deck, drops in the lower deck. And it's one strike on Davis. One strike is the count. Now it's yelling, they want a homer. Throws the ball in. The umpire puts another ball in play, examines that one. Can't find anything wrong with it, does it back in his pocket. One strike. Throws again and the hitter falls the ball back onto the net. Now it goes into the second deck. Misses the net above and to the right of the plate. On, on, down. The fellow in the front row grabs it. It's two strikes on Kurt Davis. Huser turned around, made a step toward second. Max started to fade back there, but there was nobody covering. So he takes his lead again. He's ready to pitch. Pitches, and the hitter swings. Stops his swing, but the umpire calls it strike three. And Galan goes up there, and the uh, umpire calls time. And apparently decides it's the ball. The umpire out on the field, directing him. And now DeRosa is going over to umpire Stewart. Looks to me as though the hitter really did stop up on his swing. Umpire Finale naturally watching where the ball come over the plate. Couldn't notice the swing all the way. And when there was a complaint, he flashed the signal to the umpire out at second base. And umpire Stewart indicated that it was a ball, not a strike. Now, Chris and some of the other boys come in to argue with umpire Finale. That happens many, many times during the season. The umpire at the plate with his eyes on the ball, often feels that he might not have seen whether the bat went all the way around or not, and he'll ask the umpire out on the field whether it did. Leo DeRoche is very angry with it, and uh, Dizzy Dean is out there trying to push him away from umpire Stewart because he's liable to say something if he's sorry for. Ray Blades, the coach, runs out there now to ask him, and umpire Fairman comes over from third base and walks away with Leo to talk to him, try to quiet him down. Leo, the captain, was very, very peeved at what umpire Stewart did, and yet it was his own way. As the first, he'd be the first one to ask the umpire on the field to help the umpire behind the plate. Now, uh, umpire Nelly runs straight out into the field to talk to Dean, who's been doing much of the complaining. Finally, Frankie Fish orders all the boys that don't belong out there to go back to the bench because the play is not a novel thing. Roach is still popping off, but umpire Fearman goes over there and tells him all, go back there and take your position. You'll be out of there in a minute if you don't look out. Umpire Stewart still standing there taking it. He runs the count to one and two. In my mind, the only question was whether the ball was over the plate or not, because Davis definitely didn't even go halfway around on the swing. They finally get the Cardinals back their position. You can't blame them for scrapping all the way and trying to get every inch they think coming to them. But after all, they're in this pennant race, too. They win today. They're in first place. Fighting for everything they can get. Now Davis takes ball two and missed the outside corner across the knees. And it's two balls and two strikes on Kirk. One, two is the count. Houston ready again, throws, and Davis gets the third ball wide, and it's three balls and two strikes on Davis. Three and two the count. Two 
to take the time getting it signed. The big one coming up. The good Kurt's got a swing. He pitches. Davis swings it. A bounder down the third baseline. Third baseman gets the ball. Throws it to first. He throws wide, but Myers reaches way out to make a one-handed stab of the ball and hang on to it for the third out. Nice play by Myers over there. So it's no run. One hit. One man left on base in the last half of the seventh inning. And the score is still a tie. One and one. Between the Cubs and the Cardinals at the end of the seventh inning. Somebody else being paid out there in the PA system. Well, they got to keep track of everybody, I guess. People who drive all day on business invariably stop at the fire chief pump. They found out by using this emergency type gasoline that there's less gear shifting in traffic, faster acceleration at the traffic lights, and that saves time. And more mileage per gallon means dollars safe. Fill up today with Fire Chief and enjoy these advantages too. Davis has finished his warm up, start the eighth inning. First man at bat for the Cardinals is Terry Moore, center fielder and leadoff man. Terry steps up there to the plate. Larry Frank is strolling on down to bullpen to get warm in case he's needed. And Terry tries to drag a bunt to start the inning off, but misses the ball completely for strike one. On strike count, Davis throws again, and Terry swings in a foul ball. It bounds. Amongst the spectators back of the Cub dugout back at third base. And it's two strikes on Moore. He strikes the count. Two strikes to count. The hitter swings and misses. Striking out for the first out in the eighth inning. One out in the eighth inning for the Cardinals. And Frisch is at bat. Pitch to Frisch in the fast strike. He lets it go by for strike one. Davis winding up again. Throws and the hitter swings in a high bounder. Kurt can't reach it. It's a slow one. Jurgis comes across fast, scoops it up, throws the first, but the runner beats it out for a base hit. He stayed at first base, but Jurgis made a beautiful try on that ball. It was a bounder that was just too high for Davis to leap up and grab. And Jurgis tearing across behind Davis, scooped it up with his bare hand, made an underhand fast throw to first base, and an accurate one, but couldn't quite get the runner, and he's safe on a fast play for a base hit. Putting him on first base with one out of the eighth inning, and Pepper Martin at bat. Davis looks at first base throws, and Pep gets a strike over the outside corner, waste time. One strike on Martin. Davis says he's trying out there again. He's ready to pitch. Pitches, and the hitter starts to swing stop, but hits the bat a ball anyway, and it goes out into center field for a fly. That was funny. He didn't seem to take a full swing at that. He got around about halfway on it, and then wanted to miss the ball, let it go by, but he followed it so well he met it squarely, and it still went out into center field for a fly ball and a fly out for the second out in the eighth inning. So it's two out in the eighth inning. Or if he can hit a ball that hard, only half time, think what if he had to net that ball square with all his power. Medwick up at bat. Medwick up there at the plate for the Cardinals. Davis watches first base and throws. And Joe swings in a foul up against the right edge of the screen for strike one. Bounds on down into the field. It's one strike on Medwick. Root and French both keeping warm for the Cubs. In case of emergency here. Have a right hander and a left hander ready to go in. Davis steps on the slab again. First base. Pitches and it's a ball. It's inside across the chest. And it's one ball and one strike on Medley. One and one. Go 
goes again. And Ledwick swings it to Beauty out to right field for a base hit. Emery goes over fast, throws it in to Billy Herman, who turns and throws to third. Just barely safe on a very close play. And getting to third base on Ledwick single to right. Bridge slid safely into third base. And he's sitting on the back there as Mike Gonzalez is out there talking to him. Looking out to play on the next man. Dangerous Cardinals causing more trouble. Runners on first and third. Two out in the eighth inning. And now Charlie Grimm calls a conference of all the infielders and the catcher at the pitcher's mound as the husky, dangerous Johnny Mize comes to bat. Johnny already has two hits today. Double to left, single to right, and he flied out once to left. Grimm tells Davis, now you can do it. Boys scatter back to their positions. Gabby coming back behind the plate. And Mai standing there swinging three bats. He is ready. Steps up to the plate. Davis there getting his time. Kurt gets the sign, looks at the runners. Then pitches and my swings hit a ball hard to right field. Way, way back. And it goes in the bleachers for a home run. A line smash into the bleachers in right field for a home run. And boy, how that ball was hit. Didn't go very high. Didn't go higher than the last row of the bleachers. All the way out there. And just went over the top of the pin and into the stands. And Medwick waits for him at the plate. Grabs his hand as he comes across the plate. And then <laughs> DeRocher grabs his hand also and then kicks uh, Medrick in the back of his lap as he comes walking there because Joe had also come up there. And that gives the Cardinals a three-run lead. Cubs still have the idea that this fellow's a real high ball hitter and that's one thing that Davis does not pitch well. Now Davis at bat hits the first pitch, but it's a foul way down the right field line and into the seat for strike one. And the Cardinals are leading now, 4-1 to one in the eighth inning. Mr. Mize is quite a hitter up there at that plate. His third hit of the afternoon, a single, a double, and a home run for him. He drove in those three runs, just looked as though this fellow might get out of there. Davis throws again, and Bud Davis falls to the ground, let a high ball go by inside for ball one. And Kurt winds up pitches, and the hitter takes ball two behind inside, making it two balls and one strike on Buck. One one to count. Swings again to hit a high fly. Billy Herman's back in short right field, waving everybody away for him. Jogs over towards the foul line and makes the catch for the third out, but not until dire damage has been done to the hopes of these Cup fans. Three runs, three hits in the eighth inning. And it all started with that little dribble that bounced over Davis' head. Three runs, three hits for the Cardinals. And the Cubs come to bat in the last half of the eighth with the Cardinals leading by a score of four to one. First Cub hitter will be Augie Gallant. And that'll go Jimmy. Well, so long. See you see tomorrow night out there. Have Pepper Martin and Dizzy and the boys out there at Riverview to drive in your car. It's where they're going to anyway. Medvick says he'll drive the other one. It's going to be a good race at that if we could keep him going slow enough. <laughs> Here is Galan's bat to start the eighth inning. Pitcher finishing his warm up. Ogodowski is up there warming up the pitcher, but Davis is waiting out there, waiting his turn. And Huser finally gets the ball as we're ready to go in the last half of the eighth inning. Atlanta fast. Huser starts to wind up. Pitch is. Augie swings in an easy bounder right back at the pitcher. He gets it, throws the first, and it's one out in the eighth inning. One out in the eighth inning for the cup. And Allen is up there at the plate. Allen at bat. He 
Keith, the right-handed hitter, waits there as Houston gets the sign. He's ready to pitch. Throws, and it's a fast one inside for ball one. One ball call. Ready once again, throws, and the hitter takes it for ball two. Inside across the chest, and it's two and nothing. Nothing is the count. And there's a, no, almost a strike, but not quite. Just missed the outside corner about shoulder high, and the umpire almost started to call it that, then stopped. And so Davis turns and calls for a new ball. The reason that didn't go over, there's no question about the pitch being a ball, but it seemed it was going over the plate and suddenly sailed a little. And the umpire throws the ball out of play. And now Houston lays one down the middle for a strike. And it's three and one on Allen. Three balls and one strike. Ready again, winds up, throws, and it's ball four inside across the chest. Allen gets the base on ball, and it puts him on first base with one out of the eighth inning, and Billy Herman at bat. Billy sort of digs in there to plate, get a spot to break his foot in as he faces the pitcher. One strike on the L. Ready once again now. Throws, and Herman hits the next one, an easy bounder out back at the pitcher. Frisch gets the ball, and steps on second, throws the first for a double play. Fast play by Frankie Frisch, who ran over in front of second base, grabbed that ball, stepped back on second to force Allen for the second out, and then threw to first to complete a double play for the third out of the inning. And it's no runs, no hits. In the eighth inning for the Cubs, the score remaining 4-1 to one in favor of the Cardinals at the end of the eighth inning of this, the opening game of the four-game series between the Cubs and the Cubs. You people who have your Texaco scorebook can record this vital series in the book as you see it at the park or as you get it over the air. You people who haven't better get ready for important series to come by stopping in at your or any Texaco service station asking for a request card. Filling in your name and address on the vacant side. It's already addressed to me on the other side. The one cent stamp on it and mail it in and get that scorebook in a hurry. The book contains the official scoring blanks for 17 games, pictures of Cubs and Sox, their rosters and schedules, and a complete scoring system, the one we've used for 15 years here in the press box, with illustrations and full explanations so that you can keep these games for years and years to come. And also tell what it means when you see those marks in the scorebook. The roaster at bat swings at the first pitch to miss it for strike one. Davis winds up again, throws. Leo swings, hits the ball hard into left center. Galant comes in fast, grabs for the ball, but it gets past him. Going clear back to Bleacher. Roach is running second base on his way to third. And Allen gets the ball, throws it into Jurgis, who turns and throws it into the plate with Davis cutting it off. And it's a three base hit. Galant tried for a two string catch there, couldn't reach it. And it goes on through for a three base hit, putting DeRocher on third base to open the ninth inning and bringing Charlie Gelbert to bat. Gelbert, a right handed hitter, now playing third base for the cards. Infield playing in, left side playing about halfway in, right side all the way into the draft. And the first pitch is inside and low for ball one. One ball on Gelbert. again and Charlie swings and misses a high fastball inside for strike one making it one and one. Again Root and French are warming up in the left field bullpen for the Cubs and they go in there if another run scores more than get on base. All the way Huster is relieved Winford it begins to look as though things are a little bit tough. The hitter hits the next one to pop by over Billy Herman's head. Billy gets it and it's one out of the ninth inning. Bringing Huster the pitcher to bat. And he comes strolling out of the bench, walking up there toward the plate. Huster at bat, one out of the ninth inning for the Cardinals. DeRocher on third base. Infield still playing in close. Wanting to cut down that run at the plate. Three base hit. 
drive for a two swing catch there. Couldn't reach it. And it goes on through for a three base hit, putting DeRosa on third base to open the ninth inning and bringing Charlie Gelbert to bat. Gelbert, a right handed hitter, now playing third base for the Cards. Infield playing in. Left side playing about halfway in, right side all the way into the draft. And the first pitch is inside and low for ball one. One ball on Gelbert. Throws again and Charlie swings and misses a high pass ball inside for strike one, making it one and one. Again, Root and French are warming up in the left field bullpen for the Cubs. And they go in there if another run scores, more men get on base. All the way Huster is relieved. Winford, it begins to look as though things are a little bit tough. The hitter hits the next one, the pop fly over Billy Herman's head. Billy gets it, and it's one out of the ninth inning. Bringing Huster, the pitcher to bat. And he comes strolling out of the mint, walking up there toward the plate. Huster at bat with one out of the ninth inning for the Cardinals. DeRocher on third base, infield still playing in close, wanting to cut down that run at the plate. Cardinals are three runs ahead now, and they don't want to be ahead anymore because they're going to be coming up the job to get those three back if they can do it. Future bats right-handed, infield still in, and he swings and fouls the first one on the ground back to screen for strike one. One strike on Huser. on Huster. He's waiting out there again. Has the sign. He's winding up. Throws. And he swings to miss the fastball inside for strike two. That makes a two strike on Huster. One up. The Roach on third base. Cardinals leading four to one in the first half of the ninth inning. Davis again starts to wind up. Throws and the hitter takes a ball inside and low. So it's one and two. One ball and two strikes. Davis winds up again, throws, and the hitter swings and misses, striking out for the second out in the ninth inning. And makes it two out of the ninth for the Cardinals. And Terry Moore, the Cardinals center fielder, is at bat. There's the plate, but you're waiting out there. That's the sign, starts to wind up. Pitches and the hitter swings it, a little looping fly in left field, and it drops in there for a base hit with another run scoring. He's going for two. Allen gets the ball, throws it to second base, but Moore slides in head first and stretches it to a two base heat. Yes, that's what we call a technical leaguer. A little looping fly off the handle of the bat. It just dropped out over the infield, too far in for Allen to reach. And by fast running, Moore stretches it to a double. DeRocher scores easily to get the Cardinals now a five to one lead over the Cubs in the ninth inning. And Frankie Frick is at bat. Davis throws the first one. Frank reaches out. Hits another one into left field, but Allen is in. And he has to block it. He can't get in enough to get it. Drops for another base hit and another run score. I thought Allen was going to get that ball. I think he thought it was sinking faster than it was. And by the time he got in to get a hold of it, he decided he couldn't reach it, so he stopped, and the ball landed right at his feet. And it's a single to permit Moore to score also and give the Cardinals now a 6-1 to one lead in the ninth inning and bring Pepper Martin to bat. Davis watched first base pretty closely, then pitches. And Pep takes a wide one across the knees for ball one. One ball called. Two out, two runs home in the ninth. And Fritz still on first base. Davis throws a gap, and the hitter swings it upon her. Jurgis goes to his left, gets it on a nasty hop, throws the second, and Fritz is forced out for the third out, ending the ninth inning, but not until further damage has been done. As far as the Cubs are concerned, or if you're on the other side, might say further profit by the Cardinals. Two runs, three hits, one man left on base. 
in the first half of the ninth inning, and the Cardinals are leading the Cubs by a score of 6-1 to one as the Cubs come to bat in the last half of the ninth inning. Cavi Harden at the first man up, the Cubs needing five runs to tie it up and six to win. The broadcast of the cubs Cardinal game is coming to you direct from Wrigley Field, the home of the Cubs, Chicago, as a presentation of your neighborhood Texaco dealer, distributor of Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline. Comes with the permission of the Cubs and the Cardinals to stimulate interest in our national game and in your own local baseball team. This is WCFL at Chicago. Hartnett is up there at the plate. Huser has finished the warm up. Cardinals aren't taking any chances, and they're keeping big George Earnshaw warmed up out on the right field bullpen. He just threw one that gets clear past the catcher and bounded way out along the fence in front of the right field bleachers. Harness talking to Davis and steps up there to the plate. And Huser starts to wind up. He pitches, and Gabby takes the ball. It's over the plate, but too low. One ball call. Waits out there again, boy, Fritz and DeRocher talking it up. DeRocher's playing way back in the grass, over back of his position. And Gabby follows the next one back onto the net back of the plate for strike one. To make it one ball and one strike on Hartnett. Again, the pitch is throws, and Gabby swings hit a bounder down to the shortstop. DeRocher comes in fast, gets it, throws the first. Throws in the dirt, but Myers gets it and hangs on to the base with his foot at the same time to get Hartnett for the first out in the ninth inning. One out of the ninth inning for the cup, and Frank Demery is at best. Throws the first one, and Frank takes a strike. Fast ball over the heart of the plate. Waves high. One strike on Demery. And Huser throws again. It's a strike two. Catches the inside corner down around the knees. And it makes it two strikes on Demery. Again, the pitcher throws. And it's ball one this time wide. So the count is one and two. One ball and two strikes. Huser throws again. And Demery swings and misses. Striking out for the second out of the ninth inning. Makes it two out of the ninth inning for the Cubs. And the next man up there, Stanley Hack. Hack at that. He's getting a sign. Crowd starting to move toward the exit. A whole lot of it. He's just starts to wind up pitches. And Hack takes a strike over the heart of the plate. Waste time. One strike on Hack. Goes again, and it's a strike two. Woo, so just over the plate of beauty, just barely knee high. Down there low, but knee high over the plate. And it's two strikes on hand. Two strikes to count. There's the first ball. It's wide and low. So it's one ball and two strikes on hand. One and two. Winding up again. Throws, and it's ball two. It's inside across the knees. And now the pitcher yells, though he thought that one was good. Looked to be way inside. Davis also says something about it. Now it's two and two. Two balls and two strikes. And there's ball three inside and low, making it three and two on hand. Three balls and two strikes. Davis walks out in front of the plate and just slams the ball back at the pitcher. Winding up again. Throws. And the hitter swings hit a slow bounder. Rocha comes in, got to throw the first. And Hack is out for the third out. And the Cardinals win by a score of 6-1 in a ball game. It was quite a ball game right up to the very end. The uh, totals in the ninth inning. No run. No hits for the Cubs. 
And for the ball game, Cardinals had six runs, 12 hits, no errors, with six men left on the bases. Cubs one run, seven hits, no errors, five men left on the bases. Time of the game, two hours and two minutes. The winning pitcher, Houston. The losing pitcher, Kurt Davis. Tomorrow, and again on Thursday and Friday, the Cubs will be playing the St. Louis Cardinals. The game today puts the Cardinals in first place, one full game ahead of the Cubs. The Cubs can turn around and go back into first place by winning tomorrow. Go back into the lead by a couple of percentage points. And this series all the way through is going to be a battle for the league lead. So we'll see you out here tomorrow. But if not out here, we hope to be with you on the air and out here one of the other three days because you can't miss, afford to miss games like this. Tomorrow, before the game, in the interview, we expect to have Pepper Martin on, putting on that famous fake political speech of his. He promised to do that for us today, so that ought to be well worth listening to, too. Coming on the air at quarter of three as usual. That's all for now. Cubs lost six to one. And so, speaking to George as well as myself, Hal Cotton, bid you good afternoon from Wrigley Field and return to the studio. Goodbye.